and we're coming in live and hot on a Thursday. Yeah, we're back after a week. Yeah, week hiatus. Yeah, I had to take a trip. Yeah, <laughs> you you are important, and people want to see your face. I don't know about that part, but uh, yeah, I did take a little journey. It's good to go out into the world and see people. Uh, yeah. You know, we're going to have a conference here in a few weeks. We, <laughs> it's getting here really quick, you know, and, you know, I'll be there. You'll be there. We'll be we'll have two shows there. Yeah, two shows, two Freightonomics episodes. So we'll make up for the one that we missed last week. And welcome to Freightonomics. I'm Zach Strickland, head of market intelligence here at Freightways, Tony Mulvey over research mm -hmm. uh, and we will be bringing you the macroeconomic data that you need as well as that freight market transportation supply chain information uh today this week this week of course is a pretty special week for transportation markets yes yeah. yeah i mean it's road check week yeah and you're seeing reactions and i think that's the the takeaway from this week is there's something there I there's don't know how there's a lesson here and there's subtlety and nuance to use multiple synonyms. Uh, it is, it is definitely something that I think we're, you know, this is a psychological thing yeah. to me, uh, as much as it is a fundamental like capacity or whatever issue it's, in the market. This it's is not, it's not much different than holidays. Yeah. Right. I mean, it's almost the exact same mechanism as a holiday, but road check week hasn't really manifested this way in a while it didn't last year and yeah. zach i think overall when you look at it and we'll lead you into your marketing too because i think this is a good lead in but yeah because i want to spend a little bit of time after the market into kind of yeah, breaking this so down. let's let's start there and kind of set the stage i'll count you in in three two one all right my favorite index even though it's the most boring index for the last year and a half two years it's the most important one and critical one to watch uh tender rejection for the united states of america this is counting the uh, percentage of tenders that are being rejected from carrier uh to the shipper and so the higher this number is the tighter the market is anything below five percent considered extremely deflationary loose freight market Capacity is easy. Service should be exquisite. Uh, and right now, we are still hovering right around that 4% uh, mark. But the takeaway from this chart is that little uptick that you see. We kind of bottomed out. We almost got around 3%. We the like lowest level in several months uh, at the end of April, early May. And now it's kind of projected back up. And this is the direction that we're monitoring. This is very important. It's not really dramatically impacting the contract space, but it is having an influence. So let's go to the next chart and look at Votri and Rotri. This makes it a little bit more dramatic, especially on the refrigerated side. Refrigerated rejection rate there on top, having a nice big spike, not as huge as it was last uh, fall and into the winter, but a spike nonetheless. This is going to feel a lot tighter than where it's been. It's like walking outside on a, on a spring and feeling 70 degrees. It feels hot. This feels hot, even though it's historically pretty soft still. Van kind of bouncing off the floor. Uh, and let's go to the next chart and look at the spot rates themselves. Spot rate. So we just looked at contract data. This is going to be more about the spot market data. And this is the aggregated spot rate, excluding fuel costs, and it is absolutely spiking. <laughs> and it's not going, like I said, to the historic highs or anything even close to where it was during the winter stuff or Christmas. But that is a sharp increase uh, coming out uh, after being relatively subdued. And last but not least, let's look at the last uh, map here, which is going to be the WRI. Blue means tender rejection rates are increasing more, uh, more in these markets. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I think there's a couple of things in that market and two that are interesting. Mm -hmm. And you, we kind of set it up a few weeks yeah. ago, right? The reefer market yeah. and, and the changes that can mm -hmm. happen so quickly. In that market. It felt like it was prime for rapid changes and you're starting to see rapid mm -hmm. changes, right? I mean, you're up, what, almost two full percentage points in a matter of a couple of weeks? Yeah. That's, a, that's and, a big move on a national level. Yeah, and the refrigerated tender rejection rate is a lot more volatile, yeah. as you saw, and it does spike. So again, but we're not done. Yeah. <laughs> we're not done. I just showed you what we saw today. Let's look at the, I want to pull up the map. I think you guys had it right. Pull up the map real quick because I want to expand on this just a little bit. Uh, WRI is a combination of market share, so t total tenders in relation to everything else in the United mm -hmm. States. So the larger freight markets get more weighting with their rejection rate weekly change. 
Uh, this is market share times weekly change and tender rejection rate. Anything in those dark blues are going to have the more significant changes. Bismarck, North Dakota doesn't really move because there's not a lot of freight volume. There. Yeah, rejection rates can move significantly week to week, but if there's a hundred tenders versus a yeah. hundred tenders an hour right. and a hundred tenders in a week versus a hundred tenders in an hour yeah. and somewhere like Atlanta, Atlanta's way more important to the overall freight right. economy. And what this shows is that that market is, there are signs of life mm -hmm. both there. I look at Memphis, mm -hmm. I look at Ontario, those three darker blues that are- Look at Baltimore. Baltimore. Yeah. But I mean, I, I look more at the, the, three there kind of in the southern half of the country yeah. just because Ontario and Atlanta are the two what two largest markets yeah. in the country by outbound volume and Memphis is they right were. there guess who guess who took the top spot this week oh, I, oh this is a big gym we've been talking about this for a bit I've written about it, it several times Phoenix Dallas Dallas so Texas, Texas coming on strong Interesting. Uh, in terms of overall market share value it's been a top three market for a while yeah but that's that's different. It used to be like Harrisburg yes. in the Northeast would be a consistent three. It's been Ontario, Atlanta. They kind of alternate spots depending yeah. on the time of year in terms of overall largest market. And then it's been Harrisburg. Columbus has been in the top five. Chicago. Chicago, Chicago Joliet. Joliet. When you combine them are right in there as Joliet's well. Joliet's a huge freight out, uh, outbound market. But single markets in general, it's Ontario, Atlanta. Then we got Harrisburg and then Joliet, which is Southern Chicago yeah. and Dallas. Dallas has been moving higher consistently over the last year and a half, two years. Yeah, it's it's a movement of freight mm -hmm. from the port markets mm -hmm. kind of inland, especially West Coast, right? Yeah. And eventually it was going to happen that yeah. that was going to move from out of Dallas and flow into the rest of the middle of the country. And it's it's um, happening. I don't and know I if you've heard about a little country called Mexico. It's got yeah, a, also that. People are, people are well, yeah, down there. Yeah, I mean, <laughs> that's... It's interesting you bring that up because Walmart reported earnings this morning. And if you look at it, like Mexico was like their biggest growth area mm -hmm. in terms of sales. Yeah. That's in a market that's been become increasingly important, not just from a from a not just from a retail side, but from a freight perspective mm -hmm. as well. Because I mean, more goods. You brought it up here on this show multiple times that China to Mexico has grown much more significantly than China, the U.S. And it's in sticky. terms of, yes. It's very sticky. It's sustained. This is in just a blip at this point. Yeah. And Sonar subscribers can look at that uh, on the inbound TEUs index if they want to. But um, I want to talk about Walmart here in a second in a little bit more detail. But I first want to like break down why we think, you know, this freight market is, you know, it's probably a little fleeting in mm -hmm. terms of the rejection rates and the spot rates jumping up. And I yeah. think it's important to note that those spot rate increases were more significant than tender rejection increases. Yes. And that's that's the nuance of this market that I want to talk about. So first I want to pull up our CLAV, contract load accepted volume. Most of the time we're talking about demand side increases. This is an index based on accepted volumes only. So this is what carriers are moving. Now we see in that white line, that's the current uh, you know year, Everything else, that blue line is last year and the green line is the year before, 2022. Uh, we do see a little bit of an increase here. Yeah. And and there, here's one of the things about that. That increase isn't as strong as it was in the middle of April. Yeah. There's two reasons that this isn't, this is a deal and it isn't. One reason, that big increase in the middle of April, short haul centric. Second reason, we're seeing an increase in long haul volumes. Yeah. So that is driving the tender rejection rate higher in a lot of these areas. And obviously Atlanta is going to be one of those markets, but this is not a significant enough demand side increase to spike rejections or spot rates in a sustainable way. Yeah. <laughs> this is something that I think is with spot rates, the increase doesn't match the demand. Like, yeah. yes, a little bit of it may be there with a long haul increase, but I think what we're seeing, and I want to get your thoughts on this, is a little bit of that emotional reaction in the yeah. spot market because the moment these carriers, which the spot market rates have been punished, mm -hmm. they are down on the ground. Anybody that is bidding for spot freight for long term, uh, absolutely do not do that. Yeah. Like I, if you hear anything else in this show, do not bid the spot rate for a long term contract because stuff like this is why those rates become increasingly less viable. Mm -hmm. That paper contract rate uh, metaphor that people like to use, 
This is the exact example of why they are considered paper. Yeah. Oh, it is. I think what's interesting when you look at the volume or mm -hmm. this chart in particular, it's kind of flat over the last, since mm -hmm. really early March, right? Like, it's not like you've seen it go down. I mean, you saw some periods of, yeah. of decline and increases, but you look at rejection rates, I mean, and the spot rate in particular, I mean, it's... Let's pull up the NTI. Yeah, yeah, yeah pull up. The NTI because L. I think it shows, mm -hmm. you mentioned it, the emotion. It's reacting like... Look at how emotional this chart it is. It looks like <laughs> a holiday. Yeah. And frankly, it's not. And we're still nine days from Memorial Day weekend. Mm -hmm. So it's like you get two things. It's the higher that these can go up, mm -hmm. the more beneficial, the higher they'll sustain themselves once you get into holidays and summer and things like that. So it's like, okay, let's move these rates. Let's make an attempt, yeah. the emotion to, hey, we can't take... It took... We kind of talked about it before mm -hmm. where Night Swift is saying, hey... We need to stop bidding against each other and driving rates mm -hmm. lower into the ground. Yep. And it's like people actually listened. Right. I think that's kind of my... Let's look at the spot versus contract chart here uh, to kind of help illustrate this yeah. a little bit deeper. So spot rates uh, in this chart, they're going to be in the green. And then the contract rates for dry van, these are both dry van centric indexes. That, that's in the white. And you can see contract rates are leveling out. We've come out of this large period of contraction. Um, they're not really falling. Uh, like if you're targeting cost controls at this point, note that that yeah. is probably not the right. You should not have that as strong of a percentage in your mentality. Yeah. If you look at the spot rate here, and the spot rate is actually trending higher, slowly, imperceptibly. So if you were to lock in a bid based on that spot rate, next month it's out of date. Yeah. Like you're already you're already putting yourself lower in yeah. the market in the in the view of the market and people that bid spot rates is like a benchmark for contract. This chart right here tells you why that is an absolute problem. <laughs> well, yeah. Well, one <laughs> look back at why look at COVID. What happened at COVID? Right. Like the rapid changes yeah. are much more impactful in the spot mm -hmm. market side than they are in the contract market. We talked about it a lot when the market started to slow down. You see the slowdown in spot rates happen first. Yep. Like you're looking at, I mean, typically 60, 90 days for mm -hmm. contract rates to follow spot. And then it took a lot longer this cycle yep. to move. I think what's interesting is the leveling out mm -hmm. of contract rates. I think it's shippers aren't being as aggressive. They're prioritizing service now. I think carriers are have finally figured out like we're going to lose so much money. Yeah, we can't that do we it. Can't do it. I think that's what we're hitting. And if I've done a little bit of napkin math on this, mm -hmm. that index, the VCRPM, if you add in the thirty percent inflation on yeah. costs, you know, insurance and wages and all that kind of stuff, we're actually that index is actually lower. I'd love to see an inflated, inflation adjusted version of this. This index would be lower than we were in 2019. Yeah, I, and I it doesn't surprise me in any way. Uh, I mean, you have spot rates that are in line with 2019. So yeah, yeah. that's there's the big driving note. Yeah. That tells you right there that these spot rates are below operating costs in general. It's yeah. flooded. The spot market is flooded with utilization freight. So mm -hmm. what I mean by utilization from a carrier perspective, it is I'm trying to fill up my truck and get from point A to point B where there is something that will pay me money. Yeah. So it's overweighted with you know this capacity that is simply... I need to just keep the lights on, yeah. pay the fuel, get somewhere with some sort of dollars in hand and not lose a ton of money. Yeah. And if we'll touch on it when we get into newsonomics, mm -hmm. but I mean, you start looking at this cash report mm -hmm. where you're having private fleets now getting in and competing yeah. for this spot freight. It just means what capacity was in the four higher market. Yeah. It's now grown because you're you're competing against fleets that typically aren't playing in this market right. just to keep I mean, to basically fill the backhaul with with some level of freight yeah. and some revenue generating freight, right? And you can't, uh, uh, from a pricing manager perspective, I used to tell uh, my sales team this all the time, you cannot live on backhaul freight <laughs> no. alone. It, you have to, at some point, have somebody has to pay for that truck. Yeah. If you are constantly pricing to fill it up, you are going out of business. Yeah, it's, <laughs> and, it, and it's all a matter of time and yeah. like, that case and that well, i think that's the hardest part is oh yeah i'm, I'm oversimplifying it. it for sure yeah <laughs> so and i think that's what's created this mm -hmm. long down cycle is the 
understanding the timing of, right. hey, if we continue to fill this because during the boom, you could, mm -hmm. and it, it worked great. But on the flip side, when it's not working, mm -hmm. it's just, it gives you a little longer runway because you are generating some level of revenue. But right. if you're losing money, every single load you move, eventually you will run out or you'll realize, hey, we can't sustain this anymore. And, and from a shipping perspective, they're out of business and you don't have a carrier. Yeah. And or they find a better paying opportunity real quick. Yes. And then they have to choose between their business or yours. And it's 100% of the time going to be their business. Yeah, absolutely. Don't put them in that position. All right, let's move forward into the economics section of the show where we had a couple of releases. I think they're worth noting. Obviously, the CPI coming in at 3.4%, lowest since April of 2021, 3.6% when you remove gas and food, which I don't know why, but that's, we all buy that. Yeah. I, why, why wouldn't you just leave it in? Um, so this is the lowest since 2021. And I think the only reason this is actually a thing is that the Fed may feel like this is moving in the right direction. <laughs> I, I mean, maybe, but it's Jerome Powell did... Target. He did come out and say that the surprises to inflation the past couple months mm -hmm. and like this not prolonged downward, that it feels like we need to be more restrictive, which means higher interest rates for a longer period of time. He I, I Now, mean, what's interesting is he said the next move is likely not a hike. Right. But for him to even come out and say that means there has been some level of thought behind, do we need to increase interest rates more? The problem is going to be the economy can't bear another interest rate increase, right. which is why. And that may tank the market. Like yeah. you don't want to have these sharp turns. So far he's gotten away with raising interest rates. I personally don't agree with the speed, but he's, we've gotten away with it to an extent, depending on your perspective. I think yeah. the debt increases are not something I was okay with. Yeah. Um, I think it's just taken a long time for the economy to ingest these rate increases. Yeah. And I think now is actually the time to get in front of some of these trends because rate increases don't manifest quickly. Well, <laughs> you're right. Because if you look at GDP and we've talked about how like mm -hmm. as a metric, it it's not the greatest for freight, but it does talk about yeah. overall economic growth. But overall, you peaked out in Q3. Mm -hmm. That's when you stopped interest rate hikes. Yep. You've slowed the growth with higher interest rates. Mm -hmm. At some point, like, we have to see where, like, you have to be somewhat proactive. And it always feels like the Fed is not proactive in any way. Very they're reactionary reactive. Late, lately. They, yeah. they, they're coming in after the fact. Um so, I mean, yes, I, I think I think there's an argument to be made that we're at least not going to see rate hikes in the future. But at the same time, that it feels slow. Retail yeah. sales, the other thing that came in flat month over month, uh, yeah. retail sales is you look at this chart. Everybody expects things to go up into the right all the time. That's not healthy, actually. Yeah. So I, I think as a society, we should probably get out of that mentality. Yeah. <laughs> but the point of this one is another data point that the Fed may take into account that says, hey, the economy is actually slowing down a little bit. Yeah. Spending was higher on clothing and accessory stores, 1.6% uh, up. Uh, food and beverage stores, 0.8% up. It's beverage season. Restaurants and bars up. Those were the big drivers of ups. But one of the biggest downturns was online sales. Yeah. <laughs> I think some of this is... Month over month, I should say. Yeah. It's not... I'm not going to... It's retail sales... One, it's not adjusted for inflation. So I arguably, cannot stand that, by the way. Yeah. That is absolutely a big thorn in my side. So it's arguably down. Real yes. retail sales were actually negative right. in April. But, I mean, March was so strong that you kind of saw a slowdown in April. It kind of Also, they seasonally adjust this thing. Yeah. And I hate seasonal adjustments, too. Like, why do we do that? Like, the world is different. Yeah. <laughs> seasonal <laughs> patterns happen, right? But, yeah. like... It doesn't. I would like to see them yeah. every. I mean, if we looked at our freight data, like every single season, yes, July Fourth happens, but every July Fourth is different than the last one. Yeah, <laughs> and we need to be able to see yeah. the impacts of. That's more impactful than looking at seeing how this year is different than the year before, agree, or things like that. The other thing, I wouldn't take a whole lot. Of, again, retail sales is in dollar value, not yeah. in I agree. actual movement of goods or things like that. So it's. It can be a little noisy as well. But I mean, you also have the labor market come in 
Three point nine percent unemployment yeah, rate up. So let's pull up that chart real quick. It, uh, it increased ever so slightly, right back up to where it was. Look back at this in trend. February. Look at it's this trend. Up. We're going up. The, the, the increases are taking their time to manifest into the economy. Now, I would argue that this, obviously, we've talked about this on the show, mm -hmm. you specifically, about how this is not a great data point right now. Yeah. Unemployment means something different than it did before the pandemic. And historically, it's not great. But hey, this is all post-pandemic trend. Yeah, it's <laughs> so, been back um, up. And for the Fed, mm -hmm. they've stated fight inflation, mm -hmm. maximum employment. Well, employment's clearly slowing. Labor market was below expectations in the latest release yeah. earlier for April. And then you mm -hmm. see unemployment kind of back up to highest level it's been in, in quite some time. Yep. It's relative. I mean, okay, 3.9%. <laughs> like, you also have to go look in the data where hiring is happening. It's healthcare. Healthcare is yeah. driving. Healthcare and retail trade are driving a lot of... I think it was a hundred and seventy-five thousand added jobs in April, and yep. eighty plus thousand came from healthcare, mm -hmm. and twenty thousand came from retail trade. Like, those That's are right two down. two very different like hiring practices. That it's not this widespread mm -hmm. growth in hiring. I think that's the the kind of takeaway is like it's not widespread. It's there's oh, a that's been couple the areas of just about the economy, all the economy after COVID is that we've had a lot of fragmentation yeah. in our in our industries. Things don't have the same relationships. Yep. We see it in the data all the time. So Absolutely. real fast, I kind of want to speed through the news stories that I think everybody should be watching. The first one, April cast data shows improvement in freight, no improvement in freight demand. Yeah. Key word I left out there. Uh, down 1.6% month over month. The shipments index expenditures down 1.9%. That actually surprises me that it's not lower. Yeah. Um, but there's still, we still see some contraction. Over the last year, expenditures is down 16.8%. Shipments down 4%. Now, I've had the questions, well, OTVI shows some up, upward tick in demand. You have to understand the nuance of this index in the way that it's different than OTVI. CASA's shipments index includes LTL and intermodal mm -hmm. as well as trucking. Yeah. In down markets, LTL consolidates into smaller shipments. Yep. Think about the name of the index. It is the shipments index. LTL shipments, you can have as many as 26 shipments on a truck. Yeah. <laughs> that is a lot of shipments. And if they're consolidating those shipments into bigger pieces, as mm -hmm. they do, that shipment count goes down. Yep. So, that's a big component of this. Also, it is seasonally adjusted. We don't know what that means. <laughs> what does the April season look like? So again, a, this index works really well over time periods and things like that. Historically, the environment it was created in, it makes a ton of sense. And I think there's stuff to be gleaned from it. But again, know what it's measuring yep. before you start. It's not an apples to apples. Yeah, absolutely. And again, the quote from it, private fleets are now more actively competing for spot fate to fill empty backhauls, creating this lower basically adding to the I, trend th or that's lengthening the, the trend. Yeah, I wrote that in here because that's my big takeaway yeah. is that private fleet involvement and engagement has become an increasing thing in this freight market. And yeah. a lot of these shippers went out, purchased their own fleets because they got sick of COVID, but then now they're trucking companies and that's not the same business line yeah. <laughs> that they're used to, you know, even though I know some of them did have it, that is not the same thing. They've got backhauls now. Yeah. That's an increasing cost component. Yeah. They don't measure backhauls in their KPIs. Yeah, no, mm -hmm. they can. Now, I will say with, it, with part of it is they if they generate any level of revenue, it's mm -hmm. probably okay. So yeah. they're willing to probably mm -hmm. take spot freight that is because they don't understand that That's market, exactly right. right? So it's they help drive that lower rate spot down. rates. Exactly. Right? So. That's that's a great point. Great call out right there. So uh, definitely read the, the article about uh, Canada, Canada's labor board delay start, start a potential strike. I think that's going to have an impact. I don't know that it's going to be huge to domestic transportation. So I'm yeah. going to skip over that one. Make sure you check that out. Uh, but then uh, air freight rides e-commerce to surprise growth in May. This is one that's worth watching for sure. Eric Coolidge writes this one. Uh, maritime or air air rates. Staying sticky. Yep. And we're seeing something similar. Here's the air uh, cargo index from Fredos. Uh, they're up and it almost coincides perfectly. And he makes this point with all the Red Sea stuff. Mm -hmm. And if you look at maritime rates, if we can pull that one up really quick, I know we only got like a minute left, but um, the maritime rates, look at that. 
Red Sea stuff happens beginning of the year, Chinese New Year, et cetera. And they've got a rate increase on top of that. And yep. the last chart, if we can throw this one up really quick, China to U.S. rejection rates. Look at the rejection rates for TUs going from China to the United States. Yeah, just spiking. Kind of shows that, hey, ocean carriers are fighting back. There's some level of demand there mm -hmm. because if there wasn't, you would start to see some of those yeah. ticking down or you wouldn't see them be as sticky as they are. But Zach, yeah. we're going to be in Atlanta. Get your, Get your tickets. If you haven't got them, use Freightonomic, uh, code Freightonomics FSC24. Get that discounted ticket. We'll be there. Two shows. It'll be Two exciting. Shows. I got so much content. I didn't get through it today. Have a great week. <laughs> <laughs>